Nations Advisory Group. We have two formats for participation, the Zoom program, as well as teleconference. Please silence your other communication devices, such as your cell or desk phones, so that there aren't any disruptions during the meeting. During the meeting, all participants on Zoom uh, and on, uh, on the telephone will be, um, uh, will be muted. Only board members and South Coast AQMD staff will be, uh, not be muted. That means the folks who are on Zoom and the teleconference uh, they will not be able to mute or unmute either lines manually. After each agenda item, the chair will announce public comment. For those on Zoom, if you would like to make a public comment on the Zoom screen, please click the raise hand button. Uh, if you're on Zoom on your smartphone, please tap the raise hand button on the bottom of the screen. For those of you calling in by phone, you can dial star nine on your keypad to let us know that you uh, want to make a comment. Your name will be called when it is your turn to comment and the host will unmute your line manually. Uh, speakers may be limited to three minutes for the entirety of the, uh, of the calendar and three minutes for each item. A countdown timer will be displayed on the screen for each public comment. Please note that you can hang up or leave the Zoom at any time. Please adhere to speaker uh, time limit and treat others with courtesy civility and respect. Failure to do so can result in your mic being muted or you being dropped from the meeting. And that's it. And uh, we're still waiting, I believe, for Supervisor Rutherford to join. We can go ahead and start, I believe. Is it okay, Daphne, if we start or you want us to, oh, there's Supervisor Rutherford, she's on now. I'm here, Derek, sorry, just trying to juggle too much. I apologize for that. Welcome everyone. Uh, do we have enough community members to get started? Yes, we do. Uh, we've read all of the procedural stuff? Yes, ma'am. Terrific. Then we will move on. Our first item up for action is item number two. That is the approval of the meeting minutes from June. Does anyone have any concerns, oh. corrections, clarifications? Supervisor Rutherford, we haven't done roll call yet. Okay. For, just for attendance. I apologize. Why don't you go ahead and take us through that then? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will doing a roll call today. Um, let's start with uh, Mr. Felipe Aguirre. Aguirre? Yes, here. Um, Mayor Rochelle Arismendi. Present. Mr. Paul Avila. Good morning, I'm here. Mr. Jeffrey Blake. Mr. Jeffrey he's just Blake? Present. Yeah, he's present. He's okay. just not muted. He's he's muted right now. Okay. Mr. Todd Campbell. Ms. Lavon Daniel. Ms. DeWitt. He's here. Yeah, he says he's here. He raises okay. his hand. Mr. Bill Lamar. Here. Mr. Randon Lane. Ms. Rita Luke. Here. Mr. Eddie Marquez. Present. Mr. David Rothbard. Here. And Supervisor Rutherford. And no chair, Raji. Okay, so we have, we have 10 out of 14. Thank you for reminding me of that. We are now ready to move on to the minutes. Were there any concerns, questions, clarifications? Hearing none, we'll take a motion to approve them. Move approval. Second. 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 Okay, we have a motion by Rothbard, second by Blake. Please call the roll. Oh, uh, Chair, Supervisor Rutherford, were there any public comments or hands raised by any members of the public? I no. don't see no. any. Okay. Okay. So this is for approval of the uh, June 11th minutes. Sophia Geary? Yes. Uh, Mayor Rochelle Arias-Mendy? 
Aye. Mr. Paul Avila. Approve. Mr. Jeff Blake. Yes. Ms. Witt. Is that a yes? Is that okay, Daphne? I couldn't see what was going on. I didn't hear him say yes. Oh, he, he is, um, he's muted, but he put his finger up. Thumbs up. Can he unmute and see him? Mr. John DeWitt, can you unmute, please? Paul, Paul, you have to un un unmute him. Yeah, 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 uh, Bill, I, I have those action items, so I'm going to be reporting on them. That's number three on the agenda. Oh, okay. Uh, then I will, I will vote yes. Then, uh, subject to Derek uh, resolving the action items. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rita Lou. Yes. Mr. Eddie Marquez. Yes. Mr. David Rothbard. Yes. Supervisor Rutherford. Yes. Okay, so Bill, you were a little ahead of us there, but our next item number three is the review of the follow-up items. So Derek will walk us through those, please. Thank you very much, Supervisor Rutherford. First action item was to provide a link to report um, on the cap and trade results. So a link was provided on 618 to the advisory group. Action item number two, confirm the process with public records department for getting names of 108 facilities. This was a request by uh, committee member Rita Loof. Um, so we did, you know, I believe uh, Rita was asking um, uh, for uh, originally just Fender guitar, and then it expanded to, she wanted to know every facility um, that is using three or three twenty-five or something like that. So I, can you mute Felipe? Okay, thank you. Um, and so we did uh, talk with um, with our public records folks and also with uh, our permitting folks. And unfortunately, uh, we cannot determine based on, um, uh, on the information whether they're using UV coding. Uh, since it falls under 219. So uh, it is available if Rita wants to go online to take a look. Um, there's probably over 100 and I think over 120 facilities that may be using it. Um, but uh, Rita, hopefully that answers your question and what you wanted. Uh, I know it wasn't, I, I didn't think it would, but uh, you, you can go on find Rita and you know look for that. Uh, as you can imagine, we have a number of public records requests that we get, um, and for us to actually do the same research um, that you know is available to the public, you could do the same thing uh, on the online. And Daphne, if you want to add into that, you're more than welcome to. No, I don't have anything to add. Uh, Rita, did you want to say something? Yes, thank you. So let me clarify, um, and especially for the supervisor um, that may, she may not have uh, heard previous discussions. Um, even though the facility that was called to my attention was Fender Guitar because they decided to add a UV coating uh, to their existing process, uh, when the staff, my request was for um, any facilities that have been made to obtain permits uh, when installing UV equipment. Now, staff has already identified, they came up with the number 180, 108 facilities. 
I don't have access to those facilities online. I have looked at the fine system. And if I have a facility name, I could find it on find, pardon the pun, um, but I don't have facility names. And staff has already told me that they know of 108 permits for UV companies that have been asked or required to obtain permits, even though in our opinion, they really shouldn't have had to get permits because they should be exempted from rule 219, which is the issue that we're working on with Fender Guitar. So there's 108 facilities. We know that for a fact. I just need the names of the facilities so I can look it up on fine. And I realize that the district, um, you know, receives uh, many Public Records Act requests, uh, but there are statutory guidelines and mandates on complying with uh, requests and cost to the public agency is not one of the uh, reasons for not providing public records. So I would reiterate my request. Let's see. Um, and I didn't just request Fender. I requested all facilities that were using UV. Staff already knows there's 108 facilities. I just need the names of the facilities. Yeah, and, and Rita, and, and I appreciate that. I think uh, back when you submitted your original request in January, um, it was just for Fender, and then I think you expanded it after we responded. Uh, but I know our the deputy executive officer for permitting did respond that um, that uh, they we can't query, and this is I'm just repeating what he what he said. They can't query for UV coating operations. That's something we cannot do. Um, so uh, I'll go back to him. And, I'll, um, and be more specific um, and see what we can do. But, um, and in no, no way did I mean to say that, you know, we were trying to skirt our responsibilities under the public records request. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it takes us a while um, to respond. And, you know, that's what, under this circumstances, it's, it, it's a little bit more work and not that we're not trying to do it, but this is the information I got back from permitting that they can't actually do the query um, to find UV coding operations. So if I may add to that, and maybe it'll help facilitate the discussion with permitting. Um, so a long, long time ago, long, long time ago, over 28 years ago, I was a permit engineer for the South Coast Air Quality Management District. And um, there is an equipment description code called the BCAP, which is a uh, basic category. And it's a number that way back when we weren't as sophisticated as we are now with computers. Um, and we could track what type of equipment. So graphic arts, UV flexo has a BCAP. So maybe we could start there identifying the BCAPs or flexo graphic arts because UV has a specific BCAT. And I have those numbers so I can provide them to engineering if that's gonna help facilitate the records. Let me go back to Jason and talk to him about that and see if we can do that. I'm, I'm not sure if we're still coding it that way. I don't know. I'm not I'm, I'm permitting. 28 years ago is a long, long time ago. And I know I've changed the way I do things to, from 28 years ago, but maybe we still use it. I just need to ask the question. Okay, thank you. Um, item number three, uh, follow up on status update of Rule 219. Um, I believe you also asked for agendized an update for Rule 219. It looks like we're going to have that update, a general update in, in September. And I think that was your request, Rita, right? Okay. And then action number five was research, possi research possibility of transferring Home Rule Advisory Group to local government and small business assistance advisory group. So we have been in discussions uh, with the chair and uh, I'll be providing an update probably at the next meeting, but uh, it looks like uh, he just wanted to find out if in fact the people that were, uh, were on home rule would also want to be added to, um, to the um, LGSBA or if there's any, I know there's a couple of folks 
on right now that were on that are on both. And uh, we just got to figure out how we're going to do that because the charter for LGSBA limits the amount of people uh, we can have on here. And so we just got to figure that out. And Derek, I think that was coming from my request about home rule. And I have talked to several home rule members. And I think the consensus is it would be best to keep it as a separate group because it does get to, into a lot of meat of rules and regulations. And I, I don't know if it'd be a perfect mesh for this group, but it certainly distract local government quite a bit to get into that level of detail. And I appreciate that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we have to, you know, talk to them too. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and, and, and I'll talk to who, um, I believe planning is in charge of home rule and see if they can reach out to their, to their committee members and see if they're willing to, to, to do that. But uh, I appreciate you reaching out to them too. Uh, it was a request by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez last month to see if we can bring, the, bring those items over. So I just responded back to basically what he had requested last at the last um, LGSBA meeting. Greg, I appreciate that. And if there's anything you'd like me to do, please, please let me know. All right, thank you. And Supervisor Rutherford, that's the last of our um, action items. Terrific, thank you for those updates. So our first okay. discussion item is an update on Assembly Bill 617, which are environmental justice communities and the work we're doing with them. So we will turn to Daniel Wong for a report. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Supervisor. Um, so my name is Daniel Wong. I'm a senior public information specialist in the Legislative Public Affairs and Media Division. And today I'll be giving you a, a assembly a update on Assembly Bill 617. Uh, next slide, please. I, I do, Derek, I do see a hand from Bill Lamar. Is that a, a pre-question? A pre yeah, I think Bill, do, can you wait or did you want to ask it before um, we start the presentation? I uh, actually, my, my comment was was with respect to the possibility of combining the two advisory groups. I can either make the comment now or wait till after the presentation. I'll let Supervisor Rutherford determine that. Just go ahead and make it now. Okay. Um, thank you, Supervisor. Um, I, I would also uh, support David Rothbart's uh, comments and, and his uh his reluctance to, to see or to attempt to combine the uh, the two advisory groups. I was part of the uh, original Blue Ribbon Committee uh, that was developed to, uh, to investigate and update the charter, the missions of, of all the advisory groups uh, and their, and their, their purpose. Uh, home rule is, is, is unique. It's a, it's a, it's a more high level policy committee to look at uh, possibly consolidating uh, 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 or eliminating or some revamping overlapping federal, state and local regulations uh, to, uh, to streamline regulatory compliance. Uh, the, by and large, the members of Home Rule represent large businesses, uh, utilities, refineries, uh, aerospace aircraft. At that time, the uh, chair of the governing board uh, also in inserted a small business considerations subcommittee in there, uh, which I chair or chaired uh, uh, when, when, the, when home rule was active. But it was with the understanding that, that that it was not to turn home rule into a duplicate of small business and local government, uh, and, and they, which has their own charter. So uh, when, when, this, when this came before the governing board at that time, uh, our recommendations were, were approved by the then governing board. And I feel uncomfortable with staff uh, arbitrarily amending charters or missions of, of, of advisory groups uh, without uh, 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 at least consulting with those of us who give of our time to participate in the advisory groups 
and lend our experience and expertise uh, to the staff and to the board members. Bill, I appreciate that perspective and uh, we'll certainly consider that as we go through the discussions and go back to the chair and the other board members who are interested on it, so. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Daniel, sorry for that interruption and not seeing that hand earlier, but go ahead and go back to the 617 report. No worries, thank you, Supervisor. So um, getting back to presentation, um, I'm presenting on Assembly Bill 617, which was authored by Assemblymember Christina Garcia. It's a statewide program that was signed into law on July 26, 2017. Um, this requires a statewide strategy to reduce air, air quality, I mean, sorry, toxic air contaminants and criteria pollutants in disadvantaged communities. Uh, requires a selection of additional communities or locations annually as appropriate. Uh, next slide, please. And here are some elements, some key elements of AB 617. Uh, first, I don't know if y'all can read it, but it's uh, that first little box is community air monitoring plans, which we refer to as the CAMP and community emissions reduction plans, which we refer to as SERPs. Um, they must be created in, for each designated AB 617 community, and they're created through the work of staff along with uh, commu the community members from the community steering committee, which we refer to as normally as a CSC, and each plan is tailored to each particular community. And um, also um, key to these, to, to the 617 is um, clean technology investments, um, investing in, in best available retrofit control technologies, BARC rules, and uh, providing easier access to emissions data. Uh, next slide, please. And so we currently have six AB 617 designated communities um, under South Coast jurisdiction. And you can see on the, in 2018, we designated what we call year one communities. Uh, that's Wilmington, Carson, West Long Beach, uh, San Bernardino, Muscoy, uh, San East LA, Boyle Heights, and West Commerce. And in 2019, we designated uh, two communities, uh, which we refer to as our year two communities, which is Southeast LA and Eastern, the Eastern Coachella Valley. Uh, next slide, please. And as of October, 2020, uh, we designated South LA. Uh, we recommended South South Los Angeles to be our sixth community. Uh, we, it went to our board and it was recommended to our board in October 2020, and CARB approved this in February 2021. Uh, what makes this community a little bit unique is that we are uh, we have co-hosts or, or partners, community partners that we're working with. This is the first time we've done this. Uh, we have it's a, so it's a multi-lead um, co-hosted community. And um, we're, those multi-lead organizations are PSRLA, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Los Angeles, uh, SCOPE, otherwise known as um, Strategic Concepts in Organizing and Policy Education, and uh, Watts Clean Air and Ed Energy Committee. So those are our, our three partners in this. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some of the elements that make up an AB 617 community plan. Uh, we start with incentives, um, outreach and education, regulation, enforcement, monitoring, exposure reduction, public information, and collaborating with, uh, with our community stakeholders. Um, so during, during the first year of development, um, we meet on a monthly basis. I'm sorry, I think I got my slides mixed up. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, here we go. So we meet on a monthly basis when we're first starting out in a, in a first year in the CSE community. And we build um, the community steering committee with um, active residents, community organizations, agencies, local business owners, and land use authorities and, and, and others. And we meet on a monthly basis. Um, after the first year, we move to quarterly meetings. And uh, next slide, please. And so 2020, 2020 and 2021 have been uh, especially challenging. And we, as we moved all of our meetings into the virtual realm and in keeping with our EJ, EJ themes, you know, we, we're continuing to meet people where they are and we've been uh, conducting all of our meetings via Zoom. Um, you can see we, we send out digital flyers. Um, 
we post events and we, we create events on, on Facebook and we, and we put out uh, social media posts on Instagram and Twitter. In addition to that, we e-blast flyers out and we keep our community updated through newsletters and um, constant phone calls. Um, I myself, I'm the liaison for San Bernardino Muscoy. And, and I know my folks are constantly calling me and I'm, I'm touching base with them and I'm just checking in with, with folks just to make sure that they're, that I'm, I've, you know, they don't have any questions or they don't have any concerns. And um, in, the, in the before times, before the pandemic, all of our CSC meetings were also streamed live to Facebook. And when we've continued that practice, we stream everything to Facebook. And so if, if any of our folks were like miss a meeting, they can always go back and get caught up. Uh, we, we provide materials and all our presentations are also provided in Spanish and as well as English. And uh, we have live interpretation services during each meeting. And also a huge thanks to our IM team. They helped make this all possible on the fly. And, you know, we've been at this for about a year and a half now, and, and we're going to continue doing this as long as we can. So next slide, please. So where are we now? Uh, with the year one communities, uh, the first three year, year one communities, we've we're in our SERP implementation phase. Uh, we're meeting on a quarterly basis. Our year two communities, which is CELA and, and ECV, uh, we're meeting on a quarterly basis as well. Um, CARB just approved the CELA SERP back in May. Uh, with the ECV SERP, um, amendments were submitted and it's going to going for a SERP uh, final approval in June. And CARB's considering the ECV SERP in the fall, of, uh, considering the um, SERP in fall. Uh, our year three community south with South LA, uh, we're meeting monthly and we're working to currently developing the camp in the SERP now. Uh, next slide, please. So once again, this is kind of a recap. Uh, what makes up uh, a SERP? Uh, we have rules, regulations, enforcement, air monitoring, collaboration, incentives. And this is all gonna lead to emission reductions. And with that, um, if anyone has any questions, that's that's all for formalities. Perfect. Thank you for that report. Are there questions? Right. I see a couple of hands. We'll start with uh, Paul Avila. Daniel, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, Daniel. On one of your slides, there was a uh, little box on data gathering. Okay. Not a problem. Uh, I totally in concurrence with what you're doing, and I believe in it, especially for outreach for AQMD. So I'm I'm on your side. I do have a question though on data gathering because over the years it seems that uh, I'm trying to say this intelligently. Certain certain uh, enemies of the uh, environment, and we'll leave that one alone, uh, will gather data and usually sue industry or sue AQMD. One of the two. And my question is, what kind of data is gathered, if you know, and uh, how is it accumulated? And then I'm going to mute. And if you could answer that, thank you very much. OK, well, I, I, I can answer it, but I think uh, my colleague Dan Garcia might be here. If Dan's here, he, he might give you a little bit more detail. Um, unless you want to take a shot at it, Dan. Sure, I, 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 can, um, I can respond uh, to uh, committee member Avila. Uh, so good morning, um, uh, Chair Rutherford and, and committee members. Uh, my name is Dan Garcia. I'm the AB617 uh, planning manager. Um, and so when, uh, we, when we refer to the data gathering portion of AB617, um, one of the, 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 the key pieces that goes into that is um, really at, this, at the you know, initial start of um, selecting a community. Um, we, we have a sense of the types of sources that are in, the, in those communities. But then what we do is as we um, further define the community boundary, so which that is now done for all of the, the, the six communities that are in the program, we go through and um, our, 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 our technical staff um, looks, uh, really provides an in-depth um, review and look at the sources within those community boundaries. And so that's the data gathering that, that is done so that the, the community has a sense of what the baseline um, emissions are in that community. Um, and when, when we speak to emissions, we talk about, you know, all the different pollutants, the criteria pollutants, as well as, uh, as any um, quantifiable toxics. 
And so that is the, the data gathering um, portion that um, Daniel is uh, referencing in his slides. And so, and obviously, um, you know, this is, this is different, uh, somewhat different than kind of what happens on a more regional and, and statewide level, because um, we really took, a, we really take a very close look at the nuts and bolts of the emissions inventory within that particular uh, community, within each community. And so then um, what that does, like I mentioned, is, is it gives us somewhat of a baseline, but it also helps us in the future to identify um, you know, the progress that we make in these communities in the way of emission reductions and uh, reducing um, exposures to, to toxics. So, so that, that is the data gathering that Daniel's uh, referring to. Awesome, thank you, Dan. Paul, Paul says thumbs up. I think we're good. All right, Rita. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment that I participated in the uh, meeting, the AB 617 meeting for the Coachella Valley, and it was very informative. I think staff did a good job and ARB staff uh, did a good job of laying out some of the issues in that community. Um, and I just wanted the committee to know that um, at RadTech, we have a program to sponsor uh, startups. Uh, cutting edge technology in the UV and EV industry. And one of the companies that we recently gave an award to is a company by the name of Mighty Buildings. And they actually have projects out in the Coachella Valley. Um, the uh, technology is really fascinating. It's literally 3D printing of a building. They have tiny homes uh, that they're putting out in the Coachella Valley. And it is fascinating of this giant 3D printer that is literally printing out a building. So we're hoping that we continue our partnership with the district on that. And I have reached out to the um, AB617 uh, group as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rita. I'm glad you were able to join us. Thank you, Rita. Bill. Yeah, hi, Daniel. Good, good presentation. Uh, going back to your slide on how, how the community is involved, uh, I noticed that you, you list a number of stakeholders in there. About what would the average number of people uh, is it that comprise the, uh, a, a, a community steering committee? Um, you know, it kind, of, it kind of depends upon the committee oh, and, the, and the community yeah, in some communities. Daniel. Daniel, you have a slide number for me? Oh, would you say sorry. Uh, slide number seven, Paul. Thank you. That the one, that the one, Bill? Yeah, would you say that there's maybe 20, 30, 15 on um, average? It, kind of, it, it depends on community. So in my community, at South, um, San Bernardino, Muscoy, we have about 25 folks. And 20. In, in um, ECB is our largest. Uh, we have about, about about 45 currently. And and would you would you be able to, to tell me about what percentage of, of the, that number are are local uh, local business owners or workers? So each of our um, CSCs is roughly about 50, well it is 50 or above in terms of residents, and and then after that we just kind of. It, it depends on how many volunteers we get or how many from, from each of our um, community organization or businesses. So I would, well, I think about- well, That's not really my question. My question is local business owners. Uh, I, I, I've been to a, a, a number of them in person and I follow a number of them uh, on Facebook. So I'm, I am familiar with it, but uh, there has consistently seems to be an underrepresentation of local business owners. Um, I know in ECB, uh, in Eastern Coachella Valley, we have about five local businesses, you know, made up of growers and, and uh, farm, we have some farm folk in there and agricultural people. And, and in Wilmington, we have um, six businesses uh, represented as well as, as folks from the refineries. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I do know that, that there are a number of people who are, who are in the audience uh, the, the reason being is that 
historically, uh, there has seemed to be uh, a, a certain animosity or tribalism uh, between uh, the people who are who who who, uh, who comprise the steering committee meetings uh, and and the uh, the regulate members of the regulated community, and and this is borne out uh, both in year one and year two and even year three. Uh, I happened to be on a meeting yesterday uh, for the uh, AB 617 consultation group, which was a, a CARB event. And your executive officer was uh, uh, was a spokesperson on there as well. And he was, he was uh, expounding on his frustration, if you will, uh, at, uh, at, at, um, at, at the process and uh, and and the, and the difficulties that I guess still exist uh, in 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 moving this uh, the implementation of six seventeen along, uh, he was referring at that yesterday at least uh, to the animosity that exists between uh, community representatives on these steering committees uh, and the district staff. And I would think that that would have been resolved in year one uh, sometime, but apparently it's still ongoing. Uh, can can you uh, expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, I'll get to your first point about um, local businesses. You know, in the in the initial reach out when we were setting up these steering committees, uh, we did reach out to a lot of business reps. We do have um, chambers of commerce as part of our as part of our CSCs, and um, I guess second to that. Um, oh, also on um, businesses, you know, they're always at the table. We're always inviting them and they're always welcome to come and provide input. Um, we, we've invited folks to come speak at, at, at various meetings. Um, to your second point, I guess getting to the, the animosity, um, it, it's, I've, been, I've been to every single meeting. We, we've done uh, hundreds by now. And I can, I can tell you with pretty good honesty that, you know, it is a very vocal few um, that, are, that are very vocal and, and voicing their their displeasure, uh, and, but that you know that's that's kind of part of the process too. You know, we 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 get through those issues, and, and we try our best to work through them. And, and, and I think and, Wayne spoke to that very well yesterday. I was I was there as well. Yeah, and yeah. Bill, Bill, if I can get get back to your the first part of your question about small business, I know that I heard at, at ECV that they didn't want any business uh, folks on the steering committee, but you know the. The law is pretty straightforward and the guidance that we got from CARB and no businesses are allowed to be on the CSC. They are community members. And although they may not, they may live there, they may not live there, but they still have businesses in those communities. So we are very supportive of businesses being on the CSC. Yeah, I don't know if you remember, but when just prior to the selection of of the year one communities, uh, I believe it was the last meeting, uh, governing board meeting at the uh, at the downtown Biltmore Hotel uh, on the uh, on the uh, uh, Clean Air Awards. Uh, I addressed the governing board and made my point was is that small businesses uh, are you know may find it diff difficult to participate in this process for a number of reasons. One is that small businesses rely on the goodwill that they create within a community. And at that time, there has really wasn't a lot of goodwill uh, with certain people within, within, the, within these communities uh, simply because they are, uh, they're, they're overburdened, not necessarily from the pollution of any particular small business, but by from mobile sources or or an abundance of businesses, but anyway, the other was it was a time uh, uh, commit time commitment, and my I had urged Dr. Burke and the governing board to allow or to consider trade associations to represent small businesses at there at that, and that seemed to be fine. I was given an invitation. Uh, to participate, which was immediately withdrawn uh, a few days later. 
because I didn't happen to live in a particular within a particular community, but it wasn't it wasn't to be an obstructionist. It was just to speak on behalf of businesses who then who may not have wanted to stand up and, and make themselves a target uh, and to represent the business community. Yes, chambers of commerce have been have been allowed uh, a place at the table, uh, as well as as Sieb and uh, and the large refineries. But but trade associations, I, I I believe then and believe now, should be allowed to be seated uh, at these steering committee meeting meetings uh, and 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 have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We're all, we're all, you know we're we're always looking for new members um, as as folks kind of fall away and and um, but I mean I, I I do remember that you that you had applied and we were you know part of our part as part of our blueprint uh, un, under um, carb mandate um, we're required to keep at least fifty percent of our members as being residents. So you know you may have just been edged out by someone you know we needed a, a resident to to kind of maintain those numbers. So you may have just been edged out, but you know I keep keep. Keep in the process, stay with us, and you know, reach out to us. I've been with you for over 30 years, Daniel. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I've seen you often. Thank you, Bill. But um, I mean, keep in, keep in touch in terms of AB 617. Bill's not going anywhere. And Bill, I did a lot of outreach in that community. It's not my district, but it is my county. And we had a very difficult time finding business folks who were interested and available to participate. So it is just a challenge in the makeup of these committees and the constraints that the state has given us, but we hear you and we want that voice represented there as well. Rita, did you have comments on this? Yes, I just wanted to thank Bill for bringing that up. We were basically in the same boat, uh, being a trade association on our small business members, not really um, feeling comfortable with uh, participating in these committees for the same reasons that Bill expressed. <laughs> So I wanted to ask Gap, is there a thought about maybe rethinking this issue? Because I was told the same thing back then. And I remember the, the meeting at the Biltmore um, that because we were a trade association, we were not eligible, even though we do represent uh, small businesses, some in those areas. So um, just wanted to hear from staff if there's a thought about maybe rethinking that and opening it up to the trade associations? I think that's something we have to go back to uh, Wayne about, and we'll bring it up to him again and uh, see if we can open it up again. But uh, I don't think any of us here can make that decision. We have to um, consult with him. All right, are there other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Daniel, thank you so much for the update. We appreciate your being here. Do you or Derek or anyone have any further comment about how the funding for these is going? Are we seeing the state yet interested in giving us ongoing or expanding the funding the more these communities come online? Nope. Uh, you know, we're trying. We Every year, we're fighting for those same dollars that everybody else is fighting for. Um, we're hoping that uh, there is a little bit more this year, um, but it's still the, the, it's the trailer bills, the, the budget trailer bills that determine how the money is going to be allocated. Uh, so we're, we're still in the fight. There's a couple trailer bills left to be heard. And hopefully uh, one of those is the ones that, you know, they'll hear us and give us more money. But, you know, until we get sustained funding as Wayne advocates for it's it's, uh, it's a yearly fight up in sacramento jill you want to add anything yes i did i just wanted to let everyone know that wayne and others have been very aggressively advocating for sustained and additional funding they've been having meetings with key legislators and so far every year we have been not successful or have been unsuccessful in getting adequate funding for the program and a sustained stream of funding for implementation so um, those conversations are, are going uh, underway. And then I also wanted to note that there is one attendee that has their hand raised for comment on this. Okay, thank you. But it, it's very frustrating from the state, especially in a year when they are absolutely flush with money and claim this is their highest priority, one of their highest priorities, to not provide the funding that we need on the ground to do the work that they're asking us to do. I agree. 
there in green. Uh, okay, we have one member of the public who wants to participate. Harvey Etter. Harvey, go ahead. Harvey, are you with us? He's muted right now. There you go. Hello, am I being heard? You are, yep. Harvey. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Harvey Etter. I'm speaking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition, et cetera. Um, in reference to business and trade groups, 30 years ago, we brought in the trade group for solar energy, which was the first one started in the country. It was, it's CalSIA, the California Solar Energy Industries Association. And I brought the head of that, who's also on the board, down here 30 years ago, and we had hearings. Uh, we had we had rule investigations that weren't followed up on, on putting in uh, solar uh, pool systems. And the pool industry came and said, oh, we're going to lose jobs. And we said, well, we're going to create a lot of jobs. And we, we argue and said, plus other benefits, cleaning the air, people not getting sick, et cetera, et cetera, the externalities that were covered in solar value. Um, this was never followed up on by the district. And it, you know, it, it took considerable effort and whatnot. And this, these were the folks that do it. And it was just kind of poo-pooed. Now, we're, we're talking about, I don't know if this is part of the dichotomy or what's happening in other areas with 617. I heard something referred to, I heard something that was happening up north. I heard east something, um, but I, I heard that there was a group up north in Oakland or something that didn't want business groups in there. And I don't know what kind of enabling legislation or interpretations or what, but um, in, in terms of, uh, of the polarity in our political economy, our cultural, anthropological system, social, uh, we got big problems in, in the land of plenty, as the dire street says. Um, we've got to deal with them. This report that came out is uh, on Monday that said this is a code red. Well, in that, they, we're still going over it, but they, 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 don't, they, they do not include carbon dioxide equivalent. They only include carbon dioxide, and that's as we and, and yesterday was was the fifth anniversary we submitted this as comments to the 16 plan, and that uh, Dr. Uh, Aaron Katzenstein uh, wrote, and that and, and that he reviewed it, and we he made a report to this committee in uh, in about March of 19, telling all about this, and that the numbers were two three times higher, and that this was a comment we put in. And the numbers on methane, et cetera, nitrous oxide are all wrong. And uh, so it's in the record. But nothing has been followed through in terms of, of, of what we've put, presented in the solar new, green new deal and, uh, and, and implementing it in the state implementation plan, which is illegal in the 22 plan. All Thank you for your comments, Harvey. Do we have any other member of the public wishing to speak on this item? I'm not seeing any, and if we have no more uh, committee member comments, all right, then we'll move on to number five, which is the update on our environmental justice community partnership. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Julie Franco is our presenter here. Yeah, it's, uh, Supervisor, it's going to be um, Alicia Rodriguez. Uh, Julie's out today. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Supervisor and members of the committee. My name is Alicia Lisaraga, and I am a Senior Public Information Specialist in the Department of Legislative Public Affairs and Media. Today, I will be providing a brief presentation on the Environmental Justice Community Partnership, also known as EJCP. Um, but before I, I start the presentation, I do want to share that South Coast AQMD has defined environmental justice as the equitable environmental policymaking and enforcement to protect the health of all residents, regardless of age, culture, ethnicity, gender, race, social economic status, or geographic location from the health effects of air pollution. And also worth noting that 
approximately 66% of the state's environmental justice communities are located within our jurisdiction. Next slide. So today, uh, as part of the EJCP umbrella, um, I will be reviewing the uh, Environmental Justice Community Partnership Advisory Council, the Environmental Justice Advisory Group, um, the Interagency Task Force, uh, the Clean Air Program for Elementary School Students, the Seventh Annual Environmental Justice Conference, and a college student webinar that we have coming up. Uh, and just as an overview, the EJCP program is designed to strengthen relationships and build alliances with community members and organizations across the region with the goal of achieving clean air, healthy, sustainable communities for everyone. Next slide. So the Environmental Justice Community uh, Partnership Advisory Council is really tasked with advising South Coast AQMD on local environmental justice issues affecting the South Coast Air Basin, assisting in the development and implementation of these programs that I am reviewing today, creating and strengthening and building upon South Coast AQMD's relationships with community stakeholders. Um, we have an array of participants and some of the accomplishments in 2020 included um, regular input into these programs. Uh, they really, uh, the advisory council really helped with outreach for the environmental, the sixth annual environmental justice conference. We kept meeting virtually despite uh, COVID. And then also um, one really great element that we've implemented recently is members provide regular updates on what's occurring their organizations and in their region. So that's been really great. Next slide. Next slide. I think it's the EJAC slide, there you go. So the next uh, advisory group that I wanna go over is Environmental Justice Advisory Group, which is also known as EJAG. This group um, was um, created in 1990 and it is an advisory bo uh, body to the governing board with specialized expertise on air quality issues. And so they really hear and advise on an array of environmental justice um, efforts occurring at South Coast AQMD. And as the body has been around for 30 years, it's continued to be an integral part um, and an advisory group for South Coast AQMD. Um, we've continued to meet regularly our next meeting for this group is on Friday, August 27th, if you're interested. So, uh, Alicia, I don't know if it's the wrong. Um... Yeah, it's the wrong. The Now I'm on this slide, which is the interagency task okay. force. Okay. So this next group is the interagency uh, task force. And the mission of this group is to implement and identify mechanisms that government agencies can put in place to better coordinate with each other on environmental complaints and environmental issues. Um, really this, this group stemmed from a series of summits back in 2017 and 2018 to work on, on, some, on some goals regularly as opposed to annually. And so since then we've been meeting and coordinating on different goals. Um, some of those goals included uh, creating and distributing a who to call guide um, for environmental complaints. Um, and they've also implemented an environmental agency staff training. And that was virtual. That also occurred um, right when COVID hit. So we were able to adapt. And um, we're also looking at new goals for this upcoming year and potentially highlighting some environmental justice videos on our website or YouTube page. So those are ongoing goals um, that we're currently working on and also focusing uh, back on maybe meeting annually. So those are things that we're working on for the task force. Next slide. There we go. So the next program is a clean air program for elementary students. Um, this has been a really great program that I feel very fortunate to be working on and have been working on. This really stemmed from an idea back in 2019 to really focus on outreach to elementary schools. And at the time we were able to go to elementary schools, 
participate in assemblies with practically all of the students in the school. We showed them a really great dry ice experiment. We, you know, we brought electric leaf blowers, lawn mowers, electric vehicles, and really a lot of students hadn't seen this type of equipment before. And so they were very intrigued. We had, you know, giveaways for them, branded material, material for their families at home and teachers. So that was really great, but then COVID hit. So we really had to rethink the structure of the program. And it really was a great opportunity for us to rebrand and also create something more permanent. So we created the cleaner program for elementary students and really uh, advocating for the students to become clean air heroes in their communities. And so it's a really great program because the students learn about the importance of air quality, the impacts of air pollution, and most importantly, the actions that the students themselves can take within their own communities. And so it's been very eye-opening for the students and they, they of course love when we go. And um, now, now that the program has been restructured, it is virtual, but we created a series of videos and are continuing to create and add on to those videos for the students. So for the first year, we had, um, we created three videos and one was on the basics of air pollution, how to know if it's a clean or bad air quality day by teaching them about the air quality index, and then also how to become cleaner heroes, how to make um, sustainable choices for your community and clean air choices as well. And so uh, for the first year, which ends September of this year, um, there's the goal of reaching 20 elementary schools. We have committed uh, 24 classrooms and I'm sorry, 24 schools and that's 88 classrooms. And we're continuing to conduct outreach and we open it to all of the schools within South Coast AQMD. Um, we do our best to do outreach, but you know, it's been great to bring this to other advisory groups because they send us schools that you know, we can reach out to. So we're always open for recommendations and we never turn anyone away. And the best part is that the program is available virtually. It could be done in hybrid or in person. So all the materials are there for the teachers. Um, some of the packaging includes lesson plans, worksheets, assessments, um, and everything is packaged. And the videos are also available for, for the classrooms. The videos are about five minutes each and they're they're conducted by, by youth. And so they're really engaging and, um, and also we leave those with the teachers. So it's, it's been a really great experience to work on that. And as we transition into year two, we've uh, solidified what we're gonna be working on this next year. We're gonna focus on careers in the environmental field and focus on, on air quality, of course, and on clean air choices. So the benefits of of zero or low emissions technologies, and also on different air quality inspection slash monitoring tools that we use so that we can show the students. So we're also excited about that. And on the next slide, we have a promotional video that we can show you all that explains it way better than I do. So we'll, we'll show this video now. Paul, can you can you play it, Paul? I think Paul has control of it, Aisha, Alicia. Okay, Paul, are you able to play it? If not, I can I can come back to that at the end. Okay, I will come back to the video at the end of the presentation once we we are able to to fix it. Um, so the next program I briefly want to talk about is the seventh annual Environmental Justice Conference. The title for this year's conference is the Fight for Clean Air, Yesterday, Today, Tomorrow. And that is on Wednesday, October 27, 2021. So staff is currently um, working diligently to put this program together. And of course, with uh, the different input from the other advisory groups. As of right now, we have it and 
have been promoting it to be virtual and in-person. But of course, we also have a plan B of keeping it virtual in the event that different public health guidelines advise us to keep it to hybrid. So we'll have plan A and plan B in place. Um, we'll also be using a new platform, which is Zoom events that just launched. So staff is currently uh, looking into that and, and hoping that it's a more inclusive and accessible platform for attendees. And we'll have a series of breakout sessions, a plenary session, and of course, networking opportunities through the virtual platform. And as always, it will be available. Um, it'll stream on, on YouTube. It'll be on our Facebook page. And we'll be promoting it through social media and encourage you know, all of you to also share um, different social media posts in this upcoming month once we start releasing information. Alicia, why don't you mention who the, so far we got one confirmation for a keynote speaker. Yes. So we are very fortunate to have received our first confirmation for keynote, one of our keynotes, hopefully we'll have a series of keynotes, but um, one of them will be Governor Schwarzenegger. So he'll be presenting a keynote address on environmental justice and, and you know, focusing on pollution uh, within, within the state. So we're very excited about that. And of course, this conference is free. And, um, you know, for those that feel comfortable attending in person or virtually, it's there. And um, we hope to see you all there and, and hope you'll help us promote the event as well. He, I think he's going to be a great uh, keynote speaker because, you know, he's, he's, uh, I, I saw it on TV a couple of weeks ago, and then we were able to reach, fortunately, reach out to him and secure him to be our keynote. But one of the interesting messages that he has is that rather than keep on talking about climate change, because climate change means different things to different people, he said we should change or that it shouldn't be about climate. It should be about pollution because when you get rid of pollution, you're also helping out climate. And those two kind of go hand in hand. And so uh, it's a great message that he gives. Um, and he just wants people to understand that there's a lot individual we can do to help not just uh, the climate, but more importantly, the pollution. Yes, absolutely. We're so excited and um, we, we hope to tape it and also post, post a keynote address. So we'll hope you'll join us for that. Next slide. So the other uh, effort through the EJCP programs is we usually do a, um, or conduct or host a, an environmental justice tour. Um, but with COVID, we've, you know, we can't really get folks in a bus and, and, you know, we've been waiting on different, you know, public health mandates and, and guidelines. So, what we've done is we've reshifted our thinking a little bit and we really want to continue to partner with local colleges and provide information, not just on, on different environmental justice programs, but also on, on South Coast AQMD, who we are and, you know, that we offer career opportunities and that this is a very um, great field to get into. And so we've, this year we're creating a college student webinar and we've partnered with San Bernardino Valley College and we're working with a professor there. We have it open to the whole campus, but we're gonna focus on, on a few uh, classes first. And also, you know, depending on how this goes and we can um, get feedback from the professor and hopefully expand this to different local colleges and reach out to more students. And we'll have staff there as well to do like a live Q&A with the with the students as well so we're excited for that that one is scheduled for uh september so this upcoming month and then next slide please lastly i just want to note that these are the efforts through the environmental justice community partnership um, this doesn't include different you know community-based organization meetings that we attend uh, webinars and trainings and and outreach so and also to note that Within South Coast AQMD, there are an array of efforts of environmental justice um, through the agency and rulemaking 
in different programs, such as the one you heard about today, AB 617 efforts. So I just wanna, wanna note that as well. And that concludes my presentation. Next slide. I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alicia. We appreciate that presentation. Do I have any committee members who have a question or comment? I see Rita's hand up. Rita, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I just had a, a couple of comments. Uh, thank you, Alicia, for the, the presentation. Um, my first comment is that uh, I listened to the discussion at the administrative committee meeting today, and I wanted to echo um, Supervisor Rutherford's uh, comments on making the uh, CAPES program as accessible to make as many schools as possible uh, and making it as easy as possible to access. And specifically, I think she mentioned the homeschool programs and the charter schools so as not to um, just exclusively focus on the traditional public school programs. Um, so that was, that was my first comment. And then my second comment um, has to do with a concept that was brought up um, some time ago through the um, air quality management plan, uh, white paper groups. And when I saw the um, who to call guide, it kind of reminded me of that because back then we talked about uh, not just who to call when there's a compliance issue, but resources to access in the business community, uh, like the Small Business Alliance, like our organization, um, when businesses might want to find solutions to their compliance problems. Uh, a lot of businesses are loath to call the district and say, you know, we have a compliance problem, we're uh, looking for a solution. They might be um, more comfortable with calling a more neutral trade organization rather than uh, the regulators. So I, I like the who to call guide idea, but I think that should be expanded to who to call for resources and solutions not just for the compliance problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rita. And definitely hear you about the outreach efforts. Um, we've also, um, we definitely keep, keep it open to charter schools and you know anyone really interested in the program, we will happily share that information, won't turn anyone away. We've even um, shared information with tribal, different tribal <laughs> groups. So that's something we're also very proud of. Thank you, Rita. Yes, in admin today, we had a, a lengthy discussion about how to expand this to reach more schools, to be more effective at presenting an online curriculum that teachers can work with on their own, as well as not only charter and homeschools, but also scout groups or other student clubs or organizations that might want to take advantage of this. So as we're developing the curriculum, we want it to be very widely used and, and to have some measurements taken so we know how many people are taking advantage of it and whether it's having an impact on on the participants. Are there any other, I see uh, David's hands up, David. Thank you, thank you for the presentation. I, I'm curious, it seems like you know, South Coast has an excellent outreach program and works with the environmental justice community very, very well, more so than pretty much any air district in California that I'm aware of. And looking at the letter that Wayne Nastry had sent out to the environmental justice folks, there seems to be a disconnect as far as what South Coast's responsibilities are under the Clean Air Act and how to get the clean air as quickly as possible. And to me, I mean, my, my members, my facilities generate a new renewable natural gas that would be a great resource for California, but yet it seems like there's a disconnect like Wayne identified in his letter. And I was just curious, is this something you, you see that the environmental justice groups are not understanding the dilemma that South Coast is in in achieving clean air as quickly as possible? Um, is it something that more outreach would be necessary? I'm just curious, and maybe Derek could take a shot at this as far as, you know, how can we educate folks as to the problem we have in South Coast? Yeah, I, I will address that. Um, you know, David, we've, um, you know, spoken to many environmental groups till our faces turn blue. Um, but they are they want nothing but zero emission 
and they're not even interested in any, I mean, there's some groups out there, I can't say all, but there are a few groups out there that want or understand the benefits to, you know, renewables, uh, near zeros, right? But the vast majority of the environmental groups are opposed to any fossil fuel. And so it doesn't matter whether we get a 90% reduction um, by using, you know, uh, near zero, they don't care. They're, they're adamant on just going to all zero. Uh, and that's unfortunate because they do understand the problem. Uh, they understand that they understand we're not, we're in severe non-attainment. They understand the problem, but it's, they don't want us to, you know, support any uh, fossil fuel. And I understand that that point of view, and I think I understand where they're coming from, but there are consequences of not attaining. Absolutely. And I get very frustrated when I talk to CARB when they outright say EPA will not enforce the sanctions in the Clean Air Act. And I don't know if we can get that in writing from the environmental justice folks that they will not sue. Right. So they will Absolutely. not trigger that. <laughs> Absolutely. There's no guarantees in life. You know, you know, we can have a lot of wishes, but ultimately the future will be our present and we'll have to deal with it at that point. And, uh, you know, I, it is what it is. And, uh, you know, we can, you know, preach as much as we want, but it's up to them whether they want to, you know, um, accept it or not. Uh, understand. I appreciate it. And you're doing a great job trying to communicate and hopefully people understand the facts behind this sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think you're, you're preaching to the choir here. So we just keep trying. Uh, if you on this committee haven't yet read, by the way, you should take a look at our executive director's letter. I think it was last week or the week before that talks specifically about non uh, zero emission versus close to zero emission vehicles. Uh, it was very well researched and um, addresses the exact issues that you're talking about. So if anybody hasn't seen that yet, Derek, perhaps we could distribute that to the committee. We will distribute that to the committee, the letter. Yes. Great. All right. Do we have any other members of the committee who wish to speak on this item? Do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? Got Harvey Etter. Harvey? Hello, Harvey? am I being heard? You're am being, being heard. heard. Go ahead. Yes, you are. Go ahead. Hello, I'm Harvey Etter. I'm speaking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition, et cetera. Um, this stuff with renewable natural gas, okay? Um, Santa Monica has 200 buses that get out of a waste uh, site in Texas. Uh, they're renewable natural gas for their buses. Okay, they ship it all, all the way in pipeline here. Now, what we don't know, and we brought this up in, in, in the 16 plan and before in the, in the 12 plan, drug-resistant antibiotics, and uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, EPA, the CDC said that there were, there were uh, like 10, 15,000 deaths a year, uh, maybe up to 30,000. They put a zero on that in 18. Okay, these, that's heavy deaths. Each premature death, $10, $10 million, okay? Cost to society. Now, they claim that they're clean, okay? They don't talk about benzene. They don't talk about the, the MATE study that came up that said that there were 11 numbers of benzene compared to 11, 44 numbers of, of, of diesel PM. All right. That's still 20% of the problem is benzene and the district's done nothing on that. It's come out at 617 meetings. We've gone to bat on this stuff. Look, we've gone to bad to the low carbon fuel. So this is going to go national. This is garbage that put drug resistant antibiotics, antifungals, and antiviruses in the system, from waste systems, from sewage, landfills, and, 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 the, and, the, and the, these uh, treatment plants, the growth for the animals, 70% of the human antibiotics go to the animals. All right? Completely not looking at that, not putting it in the calculus, totally ignored it. And that's outrageous. And we keep on bringing this up. And we are, in fact, 
the public, the ombuds folks, as Dr. Burke referred, referred to us, the citizens bringing solar to us for, for years and years and years. His quote, God knows how many years. All right. Hey, this, this, this st- study that came out and it's being reevaluated. Where's Capcoa? Where's the district? Where's CARB? They're reevaluating this now. We've got to stop the CO2 stuff. We've got Caymans at Berkeley and Jacobson at Stanford saying, plant trees. We don't got to take this stuff out of the air like Gates and, and, and whatever we want to do. And we don't know what the hell we're doing with it. And, and we got to have environmental justice and stuff. Equity right now. This stuff is being done and decided right now. As well as get rid of this neighborhood nuke stuff. I was active for many years with, 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 the, with the, the anti-nuke groups. We had 20, 30 communities here. We did CD at, at the nukes when we got them changed around. But it, it's an even... We- Thank you for your comments, Harvey. Any other member of the public wishing to comment? There's no others, Madam Chair. All right. Seeing no others, that was just an update. There's no need for any action. We have a written report on our monthly small business activities. Does anyone have any questions or comments on that item? Bill Lamar. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Supervisor. I just had, had, a, had a question at, at, last, at the, uh, our last meeting. Uh, I, I mentioned, uh, asked a question about the, uh, uh, the board retreat, the, the resumption of that, and Jill mentioned that it was tentatively scheduled for the 16th and 17th of September at an undisclosed desert location. And I was just curious if she had any more information on that that she would uh, could share with us. Sure, let me pull up my uh, agenda so I can uh, get the location correct. We are still thinking about whether or not it's going to be in person slash hybrid or whether it could possibly be um, an in-person, you know, depending on the, the way the retreat shapes out. I mean, the Delta variant. And so it is September 16th and 17th, and it's at the Renaissance uh, in uh, the Palm Desert area. Sorry, I opened up the wrong file. One second here. Um, bear with me a moment. Uh, the Renaissance and Esmeralda Resort and Spa in Indian Wells is where we're planning this, um, but we're watching the variant and um, assessing how safe it would be. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Jill, is that the uh, uh, is that the hotel that we were at the last? Uh, I guess I guess the last board retreat meeting. Uh, That's correct. Prior to the pandemic. Yes. In in Indian Wells. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, Jill, do you have any idea when we're going to be making the call and whether it's virtual or in person? I'm hoping within a week or so, but everything is so fluid right now. Yeah, we know. Appreciate the efforts on that. Bill, did you have any other questions? No. Uh, David, I see your hand up. I'm sorry, I forgot to take it down. Okay, just want to give you the chance. Any other committee members, any comments on this report? Just a comment. Go ahead, John. Uh, it'll, in September, it'll probably be hot enough you'll kill every virus that's around, so good luck. You know, I wish we had a magic wand like that. If we knew heat could do it, we'd all take the blast for a little while. Any other comments? Any other business before the body? Right, this brings us to public <laughs> comments. Do we have any public comment today? Harvey Yetter has his hand up. All right, Harvey, three minutes, go ahead. Hello, am I being heard? Yes, yes. you are. Hi, I'm Harvey Yetter. I'm speaking for myself and for the Public Solar Power Coalition, et cetera. Um, one thing I, I, wa- I want to bring to all, and we've been bringing this up since the COVID, that it's actually, it's, it, SARS-1 is an 203, SARS-2 was, they called it MERS, because it was from bats to camels, and they called it Middle East Respiratory System to a uh, difference to the Saudis, just like the murder that they did. All right, so we, 
we got big problems now. This is SARS-3. All right. The one that Saudis had had 34% death rate. We got a D variant now. And those folks that aren't being vaccinated, they increase the stuff when people have weak immune systems and stuff to get a, another number of the deaths up like that. And that. People do not know the history of it and the facts. We have to get to the real, the facts, just that the real CO2 numbers are CO2 equivalent, and it's just two, three times bigger right now than it was. And we got to be honest with people, with the kids especially. And they're going to have to be tough, tougher than us. And we got to teach them. And, and, and this thing, I don't know if it covered religious schools or if that's covered by, uh, I have shows my ignorance of special education and home and whatnot. But any, anyway, so. I'm real concerned about this and, and, and that, that, that the vaccine, okay, uh, 90% have got pneumonia from this, and that's what kills them. And I had pneumonia when I was 9 and 18, and, and it's no fun when you're a kid. And these kids, can, they have shots for 20 years, a P13 and a P23 for pneumonia. Four, half a billion get it a year, four million die, half of those are kids. And that includes thousands in this country right here in River City. And we, some of us have got our own flesh and blood in it, and this has got to be done right now. And with the teachers' unions and all that, we're trying to contact them and anything with local governments to the school districts. All right, you're set up this way. This is a crisis right now, and we've got to deal with it. And it is available. I've heard some talk about it. We've been talking to CDC and FDA for a year and a half about this. All right. This this is something. And, 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 and the minorities and low income are where the death counts are up. And that's our my class. And uh, we got to protect our own. And if we don't do it, like, like Dr. Burke said, we got to speak out for those that can't. Okay? I'm speaking out. I'm speaking for my own class and for y'all. And it's got to be done, and we got to get on this stuff right now. We cannot mess around in this whole dividing stuff and, and, and politics in the future. Also, I want to, you should check out this Israeli historian named Harari. Uh, Yavol Noah Harari, I want to put it in here. He's, t- he's talking to everybody around who's anybody, and he's got stuff to say. He's Israeli, he's gay, and he's a historian. He specialized in the Middle East, in the Middle Ages, and uh, when there was honor in battle and whatnot. But he's excellent. He, he met with, uh, yeah, he's been a. Thank you, Harvey. If we have no other public speakers, then we will stand adjourned. Thank you all for participating. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.